Uh, our third and final talk, uh, speaker this morning is Nancy Boaz, uh, who is an art historian, uh, author, and independent curator. Her recent biography, David Park, A Painter's Life, published by UC Press, was named one of the San Francisco Chronicle's best books of 2012. She's also the author of The Society of Six, California Colorists, which assembles the work of six pioneering plein air painters in Oakland who joined forces in 1917 to form a creative association that lasts nearly 15 years. Nancy co-curated the exhibition California Colorists, Paintings by the Society of Six, and contributed to the catalog and exhibition Facing Eden, 100 Years of Landscape Art in the Bay Area, which was published by UC Press. Both these projects were presented at the Fine Arts Museums in the 1990s. As Tim has already mentioned, uh, uh, Nancy very generously loaned a marvelous still life by Demon Corn to the current exhibition. So Nancy, we thank you very much for that. Uh, the title of her talk this morning is Portrait of a, Friend of a Friendship, Richard Demon Corn, David Park, and Bay Area Figurative Art. Please join me in welcoming Nancy Boaz. Thank you, Julian, for your kind introduction. We are all indebted to Timothy Burgard, Stephen Nash, and the Fine Arts Museums for bringing together this splendid exhibition of Richard Diebenkorn's work from the Berkeley years. I'm delighted to join my co-panelists in exploring the contributions of one of California's most illustrious artists. Today, I'll discuss David Park's life and art his important friendship with Diebenkorn, and how their relationship gave a new direction and emphasis to American art at the mid-century and beyond. Richard Diebenkorn met with me at his house in Healdsburg a number of times in 1992 in connection with my research for my biography of David Park. I had the distinct feeling that it was important for him to participate in the process of developing Park's biography. Many of the insights and quotes in my talk come from our fruitful conversations and those I've had with Phyllis Diebenkorn. David and Lydia Park in 1930. David Park was born in 1911 in Boston, where his father was a well-known Unitarian minister whose family had lived in New England since the days of the Pilgrims. Park left home at 17 and headed out west. He gravitated toward the freedom outdoor life and lack of pretensions he found in the San Francisco Bay Area. He was also attracted to its vibrant avant-garde culture. After World War II, San Francisco was an epicenter of new thinking and explorations in the arts including poetry, painting, dance, and music, especially jazz. Park married at 19, and he and his wife, Lydia, had two daughters, Natalie and Helen Park, who are with us today. Park had a distinguished career as a revered teacher in the late 1940s until 1952 at the California School of Fine Arts, and in the mid-1950s until his death in 1960 at the University of California, Berkeley. To truly understand the Park-Diebenkorn relationship and its connection to the art of their times and their fellow painters, one must understand the role of a few significant individuals, as well as the importance of the California School of Fine Arts, today's San Francisco Art Institute. San Francisco benefited from the presence of one of the great American museum directors, Grace McCann Morley. She gave some of the major abstract expressionists like Arshiel Gorky, Jackson Pollock, and Robert Motherwell their first museum shows at the San Francisco Museum of Art years before they received them in New York. Morley also brought to San Francisco the outstanding young curator, Douglas McKaggy, who after World War II left the museum for the venerable California School of Fine Arts and transformed it into a dynamic institution. Here is a photo of Douglas and Jermaine McKaggy in the courtyard of the school. As the director from 1945 to 1950, 
McKeggy had a clear vision of what the school needed to be when veterans under the GI Bill of Rights were returning from the war to paint and study in its halls. The GI Bill provided free tuition and materials and a monthly living allowance for servicemen to attend art schools as well as universities. The veterans were older than typical art students and many were serious artists already. This was a unique situation that never before and never since prevailed in American society. The McKeggies brought their avant-garde outlook to the Bay Area art world. Germain, curator and acting director of the Legion of Honor during and after World War II, organized important national exhibitions and furthered the careers of local artists as well. She's renowned for changing museum exhibitions from stodgy displays into an exciting thematic installations. Most of the progressive painters in post-war San Francisco taught or studied at the California School of Fine Arts, where they believed that they could be self-sufficient and purposeful without living in New York. Abstract Expressionist painting flourished at the school during McKeggie's tenure. It became one of the most innovative schools, art schools in America, due to the energy of motivated students who had returned from the war and the presence of a talented group of artist instructors, including David Park, Clifford Still, Hassel Smith, Elmer Bischoff, and Richard Diebenkorn, as well as visiting artist Mark Rothko. Here is Park at the far left, Hassel Smith, and Richard Diebenkorn in the foreground in Park's studio at the California School of Fine Arts. And this photo of Mark Rothko, Clifford Still, and Douglas McKeggie was taken during Rothko's 1946 visit to San Francisco. Park was an immediate and forthright person, charismatic and charming. He had a ready laugh that shook his whole body. According to Phyllis Diebenkorn, he had an elastic, expressive face that could not hide his feelings and a magnetic enthusiasm that affected those around him. As early as 1946, Park formed three important friendships with fellow teachers Hassel Smith and Elmer Bischoff and with student Richard Diebenkorn. When Richard Diebenkorn and David Park met in January 1946 during Diebenkorn's first week as a student at the California School of Fine Arts, the sense of recognition was immediate. He recalled this encounter with Park and his first studio visit, quote, I had wanted to get into a painting class. I had registered late and missed it. I decided to work all alone and found a space in a sculpture classroom that wasn't being used at that hour. The classroom was on a track that David walked through every day on his way somewhere. He would stop more frequently and look over my shoulder and sort of grin at a face that I was trying to do. It was a Brancusi-like face, and I guess that's why he was smiling. I didn't realize it was a Brancusi-like face, but he did. So I saw him there, and we became friends. It was toward the middle of that first semester that David asked me to come over to Berkeley and visit his studio. He was going to have a show at the Legion. That invitation was just great for me." End quote. It became clear that there were many facets to their relationship, a paternal relationship, a teacher-student relationship, and a deeply felt personal relationship that lasted during the 14 years they knew each other until Park's death. Diebenkorn said that Park became his most influential teacher and friend. Diebenkorn also noted, quote, there was an 11-year difference in our ages. It was just lovely for me to be on such intimate terms with a man I respected so much and a painter and a teacher I thought was so important. Clearly, I was the younger, the learner in our relationship. I was getting a lot, and David knew it. And I think it was one of the things he took pleasure in. David also considered me a peer, but the paternalism was there. It hovered between us." Unquote. 
Diebenkorn's father was a, deep bus was a businessman, and it seemed that there was polite acceptance, but perhaps not a strong understanding of Richard's wanting to be a painter or his painting. When Diebenkorn described Park as paternal, with all the complexity that that implies, it may not only have applied to David's feelings about him, but also his feelings about David. With Park leading the way, they chose similar lifestyles and paths in painting. The two men had many things in common. They lived simply and somewhat austerely. They enjoyed socializing with other painters, and they shifted between painting figuratively and non-objectively. They were also both devoted family men. Diebenkorn described his first dinner with the Parks, which followed the studio visit, quote, David invited Phyllis and me for dinner to his house on Santa Barbara Road, and we met his two daughters. It was good of them to include Phyllis and me at their, in their dinners with their friends who belonged to their generation, end quote. Diebenkorn remembered, D D Diebenkorn made several drawings of Park wearing his brother's hand-me-down Air Corps shirt, like this one. Park felt new clothes were frivolous and indulgent. He loved to wear hand-me-downs and disliked impeccability. <laughs> Diebenkorn remembered vividly Park's quick drawing exercises. Quote, I'll never forget 13 ways of looking at a blackbird, Harmonium, by Wallace Stevens. He read it to us stanza by stanza, and the class drew an exercise for each stanza. He had an e endless repertoire of subjects, and each had a flicker of interest, a marvelous thing that sparked you and that you wanted to do, unquote. He continued, quote, Park's subject matter might be a hammer or a cup. You wanted so to capture the qualities of this hammer just hitting the nail or to draw the cup with coffee in it. It required instant decisions. It made you chuck most of that grim stuff that art students do. It told you something about your potentialities where economy was concerned, unquote. Park's method of teaching so impressed Diebenkorn that he adopted it when teaching his own classes in later years. Diebenkorn assigned one painting a day every day to complete in a three-hour period. He said, quote, you're not going to have time to put in your recipes for procrastination and all the things that bother artists and you were exhausted at the end of three hours, as you were in David's classes, unquote. Diebenkorn remembered other aspects of Park's particular way of see teaching. Quote, he would get you to stand back from the picture and look at it with him, as if you were an ally or a kind of co-conspirator. He had these terrible squints, and you'd be making the same squints. You'd be looking at the canvas together and imagining what the canvas needed, how you'd outsmart the adversary, unquote. The Park-Diebenkorn friendship remained strong even though Diebenkorn left San Francisco for Woodstock, New York that same year, 1946, thanks to a grant he received from Bay Area art philanth philanthropist Albert Bender. Park headed the committee that unanimously awarded the stipend to Diebenkorn. After spending 10 months on the East Coast, the Diebenkorns returned and McKaggy appointed Richard to the painting faculty, the only student to make that swift transition. Diebenkorn recounted, quote, after Woodstock, David and I picked right up. There was no catching up, no need to catch up. We were better friends when we saw one another again. That's where Elmer came in. They had got to know each other while I was away, and the three of us now knew each other. This camaraderie continued, and every Saturday, David Park, Elmer Bischoff, Richard Diebenkorn, and Hassel Smith took turns visiting each other's studios and critiquing their work. Diebenkorn told me the following, quote, every Saturday, we would go to the studio of a different one of the four, and we'd get pretty drunk by the end of the day but we got a chance to look over the other's work of the month. And there was a lot of talk and sharing of ideas and attitudes. We became a lot more intimately acquainted with what we were doing. 
We did a lot of talking, unquote. The paternalism between Park and Diebenkorn continued even after they were faculty colleagues. Diebenkorn recall, recounted one indelible memory, quote, there was a limit to what I could say. The time when I criticized something and he looked at me hard and said, Dick, you have a lot to learn, <laughs> was the only real moment. It was the last time I attempted to criticize something that I felt was not quite right and yet was at the heart of things. His freeze out was effective, unquote. It was clear that Park was more severe and outspoken with Diebenkorn than with Elmer Bischoff, six years Diebenkorn's senior. Again, Diebenkorn recounted, he would put Elmer on a pedestal for me to see. Elmer was David's peer. He was not subject to David's authority, which I was. There were lines I couldn't transgress. I knew the line was there, and if I stepped over the line, there would be trouble. Yet I think David and I had a give and take relationship." Unquote. The Cedar Bar in New York. Despite claims to the contrary, the birth of abstract expressionism was not confined to New York City. It was a broader national phenomenon. But because most American critics were New York based, they skewed the story of abstract expressionism to the version they knew best. With all the heroes clustered around the Cedar Bar in Manhattan and the Springs, a community on Long Island. Clement Greenberg famously wrote, quote, it's downtown below 34th Street that the fate of American art is being decided, unquote. The West Coast artists were either ignored, labeled second generation, or provincial by the East Coast critics. The facts are more complex than that. Abstract expressionism arose in the Bay Area simultaneously and at times in advance of East Coast developments. John Grillo, a World War II veteran and mature student, was the first action painter on the West Coast. In 1946, McKaggy gave Grillo his own studio at the school, where he created canvases by throwing paint at them from across the room and painting with gestural abandon. Grillo made his San Francisco paintings before de Kooning's first solo show, and as Pollock was just beginning to develop his drip technique. Abstract expressionism was in the air at the California School of Fine Arts well before Clifford Still arrived in 1946, but Still's non large non-objective canvases had a stunning impact on the viewers of his 1947 solo show at the Legion of Honor. School leadership also shifted with Still's presence and generated two rival camps, followers of Park and those of Still. Ideas were swords and passions and allegiances were strong. The next year, Park, an exhibition of non-objective paintings by Park, D Bischoff, and Hassel Smith at the San Francisco Museum of Art aroused further consternation and excitement. Park's canvases in this period grew somewhat larger and his impasto thicker. Although Park's non-objective work didn't meet his expectations and he destroyed most of it late in 1949 by taking it to the dump, he considered the work a necessary step in arriving at his mature style. Thinking back to Park's non-objective period, Diebenkorn mused, quote, most of all, it was the ambiance at the school that influenced David. You can't put that thing down. The school was his environment. He was there every day because his studio was there. Of course, you can't be around a pack of really motivated, enthusiastic, really bright young people without being touched. A brilliant student can do that before your eyes and you realize that's something to take home. In the 40s at the school, Elmer and I were throwing paint around. Park was one of the first to use house paint to cover large canvases. Diebenkorn described Park's methods. Quote, the house paint was implicit to being with it. If you were with it, 
you were going to be flinging paint. It was an inevitable idea of abstract expressionism. He went to the Moreware store in Berkeley, bought what the house painter bought, color in oil. They were pure colors. For David, the paint store paint had an added advantage because it was economical. He could afford to use it, unquote. Diebenkorn noted Park's affinity to Picasso and Matisse. He said, quote, Picasso and Matisse didn't move into total abstraction. They were right on the edge, and it wasn't that they didn't know that possibility. They rejected it. David, too, was at that point with the potential of accepting or rejecting it, moving from Picassoid work to non-objective work, unquote. Diebenkorn visited Park's studio often, where he observed his strong interest in art history. He noticed that there were many books in Park's studio, among them books on Piero della Francesca, Uccello, and Etruscan art. Diebenkorn said, quote, he could hardly see the pictures. They were so spattered with paint. He probably had them memorized, unquote. Among Park's earlier sources, Diebenkorn mentioned the Boston Impressionists. Quote, David Park had seen them in the Museum of Fine Arts there. High-keyed color and thick brush strokes are aspects of Impressionism that appear in his work. And Piero, of course, he was interested in. And Picasso. And to a lesser extent, Brock. Elmer Bischoff and Hassel Smith in the California School of Fine Arts Courtyard. The Bay Area art world was unusual in that it was centered around a school rather than in, in contrast to New York where painters like Willem de Kooning and Jackson Pollock gathered in bars, cafeterias, and studios. The figurative group, Park and Diebenkorn especially, lived more domestic lives and even Clifford Still set a more conservative and restrained example in contrast to the much heavier drinking and carousing by the New York painters. In March 1950, Park exhibited his first new figurative painting, Rehearsal, as the San at the San Francisco Art Association Spring Annual. And the next year, Park's painting Kids on Bikes won a prize in the 1951 Spring Show. The work was not a return to old modes of representational painting as many thought. Instead, it incorporated abstract expressionist process and gesture, plus Park's innovative concept of space. His cost concept involved cropping photographically, keeping positive and negative forms in oscillation, and minimizing the cues necessary for visual comprehension. His contemporaries were seriously shocked by this work. Diebenkorn famously exclaimed, my God, what's happened to David? <laughs> Many people perceived Park's mo move to figuration as a repudiation of abstract expressionism, a defection from the true path. It was a brave and lonely move for him and for almost three years, even his closest artist friends didn't understand what he was doing. Finally, in 1953, Elmer Bischoff, and in 1955, Richard Diebenkorn began painting figuratively. Soon, a whole generation of San Francisco painters followed, including Theophilus Brown, Paul Warner, Nathan Oliveira, and the slightly younger Joan Brown. Park later told a critic that he felt his new figuration should not be considered the beginning of a separate movement. He called it a divergence from the mainstream rather than a break or separation. All the freedom he had gained through his abstract expressionist period is revealed in his figurative work. This photo, by the way, of Park and the image on my book's cover were taken by his good friend, the celebrated photographer Imogen Cunningham. In my interviews, Diebenkorn commented on Park's return to figuration. Quote, David painted the subject matter because it was loaded with feeling for him. The feeling kept him immersed. So these subjects kept the self-consciousness at bay. That's why he chose these subjects. That's what he's talking about when he explained his re return to figuration. 
And one source of his deep feeling and reverence for everyday life was the Unitarianism of his father, unquote. No, sorry, no. This is a painting of Park by Diebenkorn. Another distinguishing characteristic of Bay Area artists at this time is that they drew and painted each other frequently. The force of Park's influence and the experience of the drawing sessions led Diebenkorn to leave his success successful non-objective style and begin painting figuratively. Diebenkorn said, quote, for someone who was intending to continue as an abstract painter, I was clearly consorting with the wrong company, <laughs> end quote. In 1956, Diebenkorn painted this picture of Park entitled Figure in Environment, David Park on a Hot Day. Phyllis Diebenkorn thought that the painting was done from a sketch in a drawing session. Probably the model didn't show up and they drew each other. Dick told Phyllis that what interested him in the drawing was how white David's skin was. It struck him as a very New England thing, like a farmer whose body never sees the sun, whereas Diebenkorn would always have a tan as soon as the weather was getting good. Park returned the favor depicting Diebenkorn in various media. This image in oil from circa 1953 is a prime example. This is Diebenkorn's girl looking at a landscape, as you've seen already, and which is in the, in the exhibition, 1957. This work demonstrates many characteristics shared by Diebenkorn Park and the rest of the figurative group, namely, high voltage color and equal treatment of all parts of the canvas. In addition, it was important for Diebenkorn and Park to generalize the face in order to unify the composition and downplay individuality. In this painting, Diebenkorn achieves this effect by painting the back of the head. Our Elmer Bischoff is celebrated for the atmospheric space of his canvases achieved through opalescent color and feathery brushwork. In Bischoff's large 1950s canvas orange sweater, he describes the figure with a burst of warm color that contrasts with the cool background. Artists on both coasts were interested in the Dixieland jazz revival but it was felt most strongly in San Francisco, where Park and others organized the Studio 13 Jazz Band at the California School of Fine Arts. Making music was an exhilarating group activity that contrasted with the solitary life of an artist in the studio. Park played piano, Bischoff played cornet and trumpet, Wally Hedrick the banjo, and McKaggy played drums in the beginning. Diebenkorn bought a trombone with the idea of participating in the band. But the neighborhood kids joking about his practicing convinced him to abandon it. <laughs> Park was well versed in classical music, but he had an almost primal feeling for New Orleans jazz. The band performed around the Bay Area, including at the legendary Fillmore Street apartment of beat artists Wally Hedrick and his wife, Jay DeFeo, who was then working on her monumental plas plaster artwork, the, the Rose. In this photo taken at, in Studio 13 in 1957, Joan Brown stands in the shadows at the far left against the wall. The community of visual artists, poets, writers, and musicians was strong at that time, and jazz was an important connection between the older abstract expressionist and figurative artists and the next generation, the Beats and the funk artists of the mid-1950s. Park, Diebenkorn, and Bischoff bridged these groups and enjoyed the respect of the younger artists and poets. Wally Hedrick organized the Sixth Gallery, the famous artist-run cooperative space, which is shown here. The poet Allen Ginsberg gave the first full reading of his poem, Howl, at this gallery. Rehearsal, as we saw earlier, was the first new figurative painting park exhibited, and the subject is the Studio 13 jazz band. 
Instead of painting subjects of cosmic grandeur like Clifford Still, Park painted subjects from his everyday life. Note the odd downward perspective, the photographic cropping, and the fact that all the figures but one turn their backs to us. Park's defiance of some abstract expressionist dogma led him to create compositions that seemed to break the picture plane, the front surface of the canvas. However, he did accept the abstract expressionist precept that the space of the painting should extend beyond the edge of the can canvas, suggesting boundlessness. Sometimes this is achieved by creating partially cut off, oh, sorry, sorry, partially cut off forms. at the edge of the canvas. Here, the edge forms are the ear of the pianist, a self-portrait, and the figure of the bass player. The Red Hat, 1954-55. Park would tell his students, paint the whole world red, or paint the whole world blue. He was speaking not only of the desire to unify boundless space in a painting, but also he was echoing paintings like Matisse's The Red Studio. Diebenkorn's connection to Matisse is well known, as Janet Bischoff has shown us. Less known is Park's affinity to Matisse. Sorry. Park had seen this great painting the Red Studio, which unifies the surface with a single color in 1938 at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. In Park's red hat, the color red falls on, the, on different surfaces as an abstract field while still characterizing the female figure. Interestingly, this painting is owned, the red hat is owned by Wayne Thiebaud. In Ball Game at the Beach, 1951, the head of the foreground figure is obscured by a volleyball. Park creates an in-your-face composition that appears to break the picture plane. Diebenkorn said, quote, the Berkeley faculty represented pedantry to him. It wasn't that he wanted to break the picture plane. I think he really wanted to smash that phrase and the pedantry that was its source. In Boy and Carr, 1955, Park uses a photographic perspective and frames the image with the roof of the car and the boy's exaggerated forearm and hands. Art historian Milton Brown said that Park had a fully formed vision when he changed to figuration. His distinctive way of seeing and painting was, quote, a snapshot view of reality, a close-up view of reality, all very personal to him. Unquote. Park never painted from a model, only from visual memory and his imagination, but he enjoyed drawing from a model with his circle of friends. During the 1950s, Park, Bischoff, Diebenkorn, and James Weeks participated in weekly drawing sessions in Berkeley. Sometimes they were joined by their colleagues, Paul Wanner, Theophilus Brown, and Nathan Oliveira. They hired a model, made sketches, and spread their completed drawings on the floor to discuss t them together. The drawing sessions were a welcome contrast to painting alone in the studio. They became a ritual that continued with a changing group of artists for years after Park's death. In 1955 and beyond, Park focused less on portraying everyday scenes and moved toward uniting figure, ground, and brush strokes into a painterly whole. The bather became Park's favorite subject. Red Bather, 1958, shows us the new post-war American, sportive, informal, and close to nature. The surf is like a Japanese print, and the sea surrounding the figure resembles an abstract painting. Park's figure's figure almost dissolves into dark and light until what stands out is the vertical highlight edging an arm or torso.
In Park's Monumental for Women, 1959, the figures stand as humankind's representatives, connected to the archaic world and to art history in their relation to Picasso's Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. In searching for what was meaningful, Park inserted these human presences into a non-objective universe. Diebenkorn believed Park's late work was key to understanding the importance of his, abstract of his abstract principles as discussed in Park's statement in the catalog, The Artist's View. Quote, I was concerned with big abstract ideals like vitality, energy, profundity, warmth. They became my gods. I disciplined myself rigidly to work in ways I hoped might symbolize those ideals. Unquote. Diebenkorn said, that these ideals reflected Park's character. Quote, there could be no frivolity or skimpiness, no veils of color, no thin painting. Sorry. With the ground coming through, you wallowed in it, ate it. He was a physical person, unquote. In the growing monumentality of Park's late work, Diebenkorn also noted the successful integration of his values and his art. Quote, he would want to live up to his ideals. He wanted to live what he preached, that is, the breadth of handling, the retreat from detail, the emotional grip on an idea. These are the things that came into his late work. In order to maintain his authority, these qualities have to be present in his work." Unquote. During recovery from a back operation when he was too weak to paint in oil, Park turned to felt colored felt, felt tip pens on paper and executed this remarkable scroll on 30 feet of shelf paper. Park learned in, March, in May 1960 that he had terminal cancer. He decided to refuse treatment return home and paint as long as he could. He began his last works, his transcendent gouaches, in color as brilliant as stained glass. He turned out 100 gouaches in two months. These gouaches were Park's final great effort, reprising earlier themes he had once painted in oil. In recalling how he heard the news of Park's illness, Stephen Korn remembered, quote, I have a very strong impression Phyllis was in the room. The terrible news that it was terminal cancer came over the phone. I, I have the recollection of holding the phone against my ear and hearing his voice giving me this really quite shocking news." End quote. He also remembered, quote, I saw him in the hospital after his operation. He was out of the pulleys. That should have been the immediate tip-off because he'd gone to the hospital to do something about his back and some sort of bed rest, and here the back contraption had been discarded. Phyllis Diebenkorn re recalled that Park didn't want anything to interfere with his ability to work. She said, quote, David really did not take much me medication. He would try to keep his day okay and draw and take something heavy to go to sleep. He was determined to hang on to his mind and his lucidity, unquote. Diebenkorn became even more attentive during Park's illness. He went to Park's house almost daily in the final months to help in any way he could. He helped construct a platform for a lounge chair so that Park could paint the gouaches in good light. He was the last friend to see Park before he died. Diebenkorn recounted that toward the end, quote, Park's demands on Lydia and his daughters were exhausting, but he wouldn't let anyone else around. He was angry, refused to die, and forced himself to hang on and work. He was an absolute atheist right to the end." Unquote. A writer uses words to express feelings. A painter makes a painting. In our interviews, Diebenkorn showed me 
a series of haunting oil paintings he did of Park wasting away, almost bird-like, becoming ever more gaunt. In this painting, the pupils of the eyes are incised, a technique Diebenkorn didn't use on another face. Note that his eyes are riveting blue. His gaze is piercing, yet inward. The portraits show how profound the friendship was, how deep the feelings were about the loss of his friend, father figure, mentor, teacher, and colleague. The paintings speak for themselves in showing Park's decline and Diebenkorn's anguish. This ink drawing of David Park lying in his bed near the end of his life was recently discovered in Diebenkorn's library. Diebenkorn drew it on the flyleaf of one of his favorite books, The Col Collected Poems of W.B. Yeats. Diebenkorn wrote under the drawing of D David, uh, wrote under the drawing David Park last year. This image calls to mind Picasso's painting of his beloved friend, Casagemas, on his deathbed. Diebenkorn expressed to me that he believed Park's paintings are the pictorial embodiment of his values. Park celebrated everyday life as the highest good and everyday man as heroic. Park said, quote, I think of painting, in fact, all the arts, as a sort of extension of human life. The very same things that we value most, the ideals of humanity, are the properties of the arts. The words that come to mind are many. Energy, wisdom, courage, delight, humor, sympathy, gentleness, honesty, peace, freedom. I believe most artists are goaded by a vision of making their work vivid and alive with such qualities. Park lived by these values to the very end. Diebenkorn admired Park's steadfast character. Their friendship is one of the inspiring stories that illuminate American art. Thank you.